I can I can lay out why it would be foolish for Israel to strike Iran, but I can also lay out why the political pressures within Israel are so great uh, that they're likely to be foolish enough to escalate this war with Iran. And in the process, I think uh, you're going to sow the seeds of Israel's ultimate destruction. Uh, Israel's survival as a nation will likely come into question at some point. Larry Johnson, how are you? I am well. Thanks for having me. Good. No, it's great to have you on again. And uh, I mentioned the first time I had you on, I'm a big fan of your work, your thought, um, and just how you are outspoken in a lot of these things, but also um, your analysis of the events as they're unfolding um, geopolitically. And I want to start with the Middle East. Uh, I was hearing and or people I was listening to that the uh, Israeli attack on Iran, uh, their nuclear facilities uh, was imminent um, as maybe as early as early this week, and that hasn't happened. Um, wanted to get your opinion on where we're at with that. If you're hearing or seeing the same things, yeah, just tell me your 30,000 foot on that. Well, emotionally, Israel was ready to retaliate the night of October 1st or the morning of October 1st, October 2nd, right after that uh, onslaught from Iran. The problem with all of this is Israel persists in believing that it is an innocent victim is just minding its own business and these nasty uh, Muslims in Iran are constantly attacking it for no good reason. I mean, it's all a lie. Um, that Israel's the biggest provocateur of terrorism in the region. But, you know, that's a whole nother subject. Um, the Iranian attack on October 1st with 188 plus missiles, I think, uh, was described publicly by the Israelis and, and the United States as a nothing burger, a complete failure. It didn't, we shot down 90% of them. Well, those were all lies. Uh, there were 36 confirmed hits at Nevatim Air Base, which is in the Negev Desert. Uh, the reality was uh, it's, it's more like 90%, at least the video I, sh I saw, uh, maybe 95, 96% of the missiles got through, if not higher, because Israel couldn't shoot them down, couldn't shoot down the ballistic missiles despite claims to the contrary. So in the immediate aftermath of that, you know, they said, oh, we're going to strike back tonight. Well, they didn't. And, and I think part of the part of the delay comes from recognizing that the threat that Iran poses is much greater than Israel's been willing to publicly admit. Um, nonetheless, there's still people around Netanyahu and perhaps Netanyahu himself who have convinced themselves that Israel is invincible and can. One knockout blow is going to bring Iran to its knees. Uh, they still got this David and Goliath thing going on in their brain. You know, David with the slingshot going to hit the giant square between the eyes and knock him down, and uh, we win, they lose. It's not going to be like that. Um, so I, I don't know if Israel's delay in responding has been because there's a big argument between the military uh, folks who have some some brain cells remaining and the political types who are caught up with all this uh, fanatical Zionism, um, if, if they're ever going to reach an agreement on that. Uh, if, 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 they go fall, if they go through with an attack on Iran, uh, then the war in that region, it will escalate out of control. And what I mean by that is it doesn't matter. So let's say that Israel decides to try to target some Iranian oil facilities. Well, Iran's going to turn around and target oil facilities of Israel and any other state in the area that facilitated or worked with or cooperated with Israel. It'll be tit for tat. 
Same thing if they strike military installations, Iran will respond. If they strike nuclear facilities, Iran will respond. And Iran's got the added advantage now with the, the uh, I believe, that Russia has provided a significant number of air defense systems at minimum S-300, but most likely some of the S-400, which are very capable of shooting down ballistic missiles. And uh, plus, uh, we include uh, Russian operators on the ground. Well, the, that increases the risk of, you know, if Israel kills any of the Russians, bringing Russia into the conflict, which is one of the reasons the United States sent the THAAD, the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System, to, to Israel, not because it's such an effective air defense system. It's not, in my opinion, uh, but puts U.S. troops on the ground. So if they get killed, it gets the United States a justification to go into the war. And we're, we're, we're totally unprepared to go to war with Iraq. I mean, we, we like to talk a good game, but we're totally unprepared for it. So this is, um, it, you know, I, I hear people argue one, you know, both sides of it, that Israel's not going to do anything until after the presidential election, or that Israel will act before that election uh, because uh, uh, Kamala Harris and Biden think that being at war will boost their political fortunes. Um, so I, I, can, I can lay out why it would be foolish for Israel to strike Iran, but I can also lay out why the political pressures within Israel are so great uh, that they're likely to be foolish enough to escalate this war with Iran. And in the process, I think uh, you're going to sow the seeds of Israel's uh, ultimate destruction. Uh, Israel's survival as a nation will likely come into question at some point. Yeah, you're on the record with me of saying that, and I would agree with you. Um, I'm curious, and I guess I want a little bit of clarity when you say that if Israel does strike Iran, specifically its nuclear facilities or where it's making nuclear weapons and its oil fields, Iran will counterstrike Israel as well as their oil fields, as well as whoever is, and I paraphrase, whoever is helping them. That would be the U.S. then. Yeah. So the, the most likely target would be Al Udid Air Force Base, which is in Qatar. Uh, it's really sort of the uh, the brain center for U.S. military operations in in that in that in the Middle East. Uh, it is uh, you've got the Joint Air Operations Center, JAC, JOAC, I guess it's called. Uh, that controls drones and, and airplane flights from you know, Egypt, Syria, and Iraq, uh, so and then all over the Persian Gulf. So, yeah, yeah there, there, there are plenty of U.S. bases. Plus, you've got these, out, I'll call them outposts, in uh, eastern Syria that are guarding oil facilities. And uh, you know, I, I think they could be wiped out. You know, up to, up to, up to this point, Iran has been... Um, you know, if you ever counted a, a strange dog you don't know and that dog starts growling, that's the dog's way of letting you know, you better not come close to me. I don't know you. And that's been Iran with the United States. Um, or like with the porcupine quills, they come up. Or the skunk raises its tail, just giving you a warning sign. Hey, uh, but they don't strike back. Or they don't strike back in force. And... You know, if someone wants to be, you know, they're going to be objective and honest about this. Iran has suffered more acts of terrorism over the last 20 years at the hands of the United States than the United States has at the hands of Iran. I mean, the United States took the Mujahideen al Khalq, the MEK, off the terrorism list and they started providing them funding. Why? Because they carry out terrorist attacks inside Iran. If that doesn't qualify you as a sponsor of terrorism, I don't know what does. If you could work out, go back a little bit, work out a little bit the case, the political case and the pressure that Israel's under to escalate this before the election. 
And why would they do that before the election? Where's that pressure coming? Well, it's a, it is the, the Zionists that have taken over the government. I, I, I'd be, I'm always careful to distinguish Zionism from Judaism. Uh, Zion, Zionism is an evil cult, in my view. Uh, it is based upon this nonsensical belief that God gave us this land 3,000 years ago, or however long. And it's ours. It doesn't matter what happened in, in between, it's ours. So, the, you know, and that, the, the, again, they always forget that the, the, those original promises were made to the 12 tribes uh, of uh, you know, Jacob that were, you know, the, from Israel. The, and, you know, the, the tribes of Judah and the tribes of Israel. Uh, ten of those tribes went missing after they got it overrun by Syrians, you know, what we now call Syria, but leaving the other two. And the other two got exiled, started 70 AD with the destruction of the temple. And now, you know, there are some Jews who remained there, sure. But the vast majority left that that was known as the diaspora. And particularly from 70 AD on, it was... Uh, you know, the Romans controlled it, and then uh, the, the, it switched over basically into the hands of the Muslims and to finally wound up in the hands of the Ottoman Turks for 450 years. I mean, hell, the United States hasn't even existed that, you know, 450 years. Uh, but we pretend that we got rights to, you know, certain property, regardless of who owned it through 250 years ago. Um. So the Zionists emerged with this notion that, hey, we have the right to return and rule, and that everybody who's here, if they're not Jewish, and if they're not Jewish Zionists, more importantly, because you know there are a number of Jews that oppose this, people like Max Blumenthal, Aaron Mate, um, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, Norm Finkelstein, uh, they're, they're, they're considered traitors. Uh, but uh, the, the, the Zionists think that they've got the right to be there and to expel by force if necessary, killing who's, who's killing, starvation, the, the, the inhabitants of that land. So, the, you know, that's what's, that's the pressure that those Elements are the key elements keeping Bibi Netanyahu in office and power. And he's not going to oppose them. So they're, and we're talking uh, Itamar Ben Gavir and uh, Bezalel Smotrich are, are uh, two of the chief offenders. Both are convicted terrorists, by the way. And yet uh, there's uh, uh, Smotrich is, the, is this, yeah, the equivalent of our Secretary of the Treasury. And uh, Ben Gavir is the equivalent of uh, Mayorkas, of Homeland Security, or a combination of Homeland Security and the FBI. Mm -hmm. Dangerous combination, those two. And they are agitating for a war with Iran. They believe, they believe they're going to sort of ushering in, creating the crisis conditions that will pave the way for the return, for the coming of the Messiah. Because the, these folks don't believe the Messiah has been here. Whereas the evangelical Christians, yeah, the Messiah has been here, it's Jesus, he's coming back. And so at that point, the interests of these extremists on the Zionist side and the extremists on the evangelical side come together, and everybody's praying for an Armageddon. Yeah. And they made it's crazy speech. to me about that, and not to interrupt you, but I, I am a Christian, um, and I am just amazed about the bad theology and exegetes. Last. Yeah. Israel and how it's enabled it enabled this really. So, well, uh, let's put it let's put it simply. If if the the people are going to take an Old Testament view that justifies the murder of children, the burning of babies, and we saw the other day with the Israelis drop bombs on civilians in tents and they burned them alive. Yeah, it's like uh, someone said, if, that, if that's your God, I don't want any part of him. He's a beast. 
the monster. And because that, uh, a, a god of death, and that's what it is, uh, is justifying the murder and mayhem of, of millions. For what? Because you want to say this one group of people is more special than others? Uh, you know, it's, uh, when we start getting into theology like this, it gets, it gets real dicey, but it's, you know, the same, same applies across the board with Islam and with Christianity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I can agree with you more. Well, um, let's hopefully cool our heads prevail and hopefully there's a stand down and that's what I'm praying for, literally praying for that there's a yeah. So, um, talk to me somewhat about, not somewhat, let's work out. Where are we at with Ukraine and Russia? And what really got me thinking about this, just, it was just the other day. I want to say it was the other day. It might've been this morning, actually. I was reading an article where they were, they were advocating drafting 18 year olds. I want to Right. Yeah. 18, well, some down to even 16. I've, I've seen the number. crazy. So they want to send kids there to, you know, to where that's not only unwinnable, but yeah, talk to me about that. What's going on with there and that? Well, Ukraine suffering a severe manpower crisis. Their losses are far, far higher than have been reported, even by Western intelligence. Uh, D- Doug McGregor's got sources uh, on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, the total KIA and, and wounded in action is 1.5 million on the Ukrainian side. Um, the Ukrainians keep pushing out that the that the Russians are suffering more losses than them, and it's just not it's nonsense. There's uh, there's no truth to it. Uh, just by virtue of the tactics that the Russians are using, preclude the numbers that the Ukrainians are talking about. So, uh, all along the line of conflict, uh, I just put, I can put it more graphically. In the last two months. Russia has captured territory that's the equivalent of twice the size of the Gaza Strip. So, you know, the Gaza Strip's not a huge landmass, but understand the Israeli army has been trying to seize that little spit of territory for the last 13 months and has been unable to. So, they just put into context that the Russian army in uh, less than two months have captured twice the size of Gaza. And the defensive lines that uh, Ukrainians had erected over the last uh, 10 years, um, most of them were east of uh, Chasov Yar, Pokrovsk, Pokrovsk, Chasov Yar. They all created sort of a a defensive line. The Russians are breaking through that now. Once they're through that, uh, the Ukrainians don't have any better entrenchment, entrenched in. bunkers to fall back into. Mm-hmm. So the, the, this war, is, it's, it's, it's coming unwound rapidly from the Ukrainian standpoint. They, they don't know what to do. Then what's next, if you would, is this just a, a, a hold and no news really until the election? Is it similar to what's going on, I guess, possibly with the Middle East? Well, the... West, in particular the United States, is desperately trying to see if they can keep Ukraine alive until the election. Right. Because the last thing they want is to uh, go into an election with uh, the, another loss uh, hanging around their neck. But uh, it's, it's very possible that they could face that. Um, the, the military situation is entirely in Russia's favor, and that's not going to turn around. Uh, so the only issue is, is Ukraine going to ultimately surrender or not? If you listen to Zelensky's speech yesterday before his legislature, the Rada, uh, it was delusional. Uh, he was presenting his piss plan, as he calls it. Uh, what was really telling, though, is if you looked at the facial expressions of the, like his military commanders, General Sersky was there. Boy, they, they were eyes cast down. I mean, right. they were like this. They were not, they were smiling and, hey, boy, that's great. None of that. 
it'd, it'd be a great, you know, parallel video to put Bibi Netanyahu's speech to the U.S. Congress, where, you know, that that was a public display of political fellatio, um, as opposed to where here's Zelensky speaking, and it, you know, looks like it was the funeral for John F. Kennedy. The somber and great grim face. So just just that kind of contrast tells you that it's going nowhere. Um and the question is how long can Zelensky survive physically? Yeah, that's really my question is what happens then to him? <laughs> because well, it seems like he has a, they have a lot of things that no matter what happens in the war, which it's not, as you said, it's not going well, we know we have a really good idea of what's going to happen in the war. There's a lot of, it seems like he knows too much. You know. the, maybe he'll get lucky. I forget the name of the last president leader of Afghanistan. Uh, he, was a corrupt, he was a corrupt guy. And he, he got on a plane with bags stuffed with money. I guess got food to Paris. Or maybe he's hiding, hiding out in France. That might that that will be Zelensky's best option. Just figure out which country to go hide out in. Uh, Argentina, uh, Brazil, you know, who knows? Um, but uh, when you look at the track record of other fallen leaders falling from favor, you know, we used to be great friends with Saddam Hussein. Look how we treated him. Yeah, we hung him. Uh, great friends. Enablers of Manuel Noriega. Look what happened to him. Muammar Gaddafi. He gave up his chemical, biological, nuclear weapons, you know, all those WMD, in order to broker a peace with the United States. And we turned around and betrayed him too. So, um, you know, if I'm Zelensky, I'm not going to sit there and be, oh, America says she's got my back. That's what I'd worry about, brother. Once America tells you that we got your back, you should worry. Stay awake at night. So I guess moving to the, probably to the election or maybe even to the end of the year, is there one thing people should just be aware of that could happen besides, again, a full-out invasion or a full-out attack? on Iran's nuclear capabilities there or a Ukrainian surrender. Is there anything else that we should just be aware of between now and let's just say the end of the year? Well, I've always said that, you know, one of the, one of the big vulnerabilities that really hasn't received a lot of attention is a, a drone attack on the Trump airplane. So, um, you know, if you, if you, if you find out an airplane an airport that Trump's going to be landing at, Create a create a little dro uh, drone swarm and fly those drones directly into the engine, take out the engine, cause the plane to crash. You know they're keen on killing them. Yeah. Uh, because we we certainly we don't have our airports surrounded with electronic warfare capabilities to defeat drones. It's just nobody's done it yet. But for one of these days, someone's going to do it. Maybe they won't do it to Trump; they'll do it to someone else. Well, on that, Larry, I guess that's great. <laughs> this is a great thought. I guess we'll end. Again, thank you so much for your time. Um, again, I'll just love to keep in touch with you. Just as things, hopefully they don't escalate. But um, if they do, you're really one of my first calls now. Well, I appreciate that. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Larry. Okay, bye.